President's Films and Guests. I bring greetings from the throne of the North of England, where the Society of Enterprise and Impossible Time is celebrating its 200th anniversary. I'm afraid I also bring with me the Northern Lurgy, so I tell you my sense is strangulated, I think that's about the year. Newcastle at the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, was a very exciting and vibrant place. Although quite small in numbers, with a population barely nudging 30,000 people, it was to become a place from whence technological changes were about to come thick and fast. Because it was small, everyone from the upper and middle classes in the town and region knew each other. The great landowners of Durham and Northumberland had townhouses in Newcastle because that was where they centered their trading ventures, and these men met and socialized with like-minded men. This led to the formation of the Literary Philosophical Society of Newcastle Time in 1793. Initially, this was intended as a conversation society, and in those years of revolution, there was plenty to talk about. But it also had a library, which is still very strong. In fact, the other day, I was at their 220th birthday party. It is good to think that while in France, the reign of terror was beginning, in Newcastle, they were settling down to have a good week. <laughs> However, simply reading and chatting was not enough for some people. And on Saturday, January the 23rd, 1813, John Bell, a Newcastle bookseller, with the support of Hugh II Duke of Northumberland, donated 50 guineas to the cause, gathered 17 gentlemen in the long room of the Turk's Head Inn in Newcastle Pontine's Bid Market to discuss how to adopt the best measure to promote inquiry into antiquities in general but more especially those in the north of England and of the counties of Northumberland, Cumberland, and Durham in particular. It was resolved to form a society, to be called the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle upon Tide, and it was thought of from the spirit of the Society of Antiquaries of London, which was founded in 1717, and the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, founded in 1780. John Bell was our first treasurer, but regrettably he was declared bankrupt in 1818 and had to resign. <laughs> Although he continued with a less onerous job as librarian until his death in 1849. Its first members were all men. Women were not included until 1877. Although Bridget Atkinson, a formidable Cumbrian landowner with antiquarian interest in collections, who was also the mother of the town clerk Nathaniel Clayton and grandmother of the next town clerk and antiquarian John Clayton, was made an honorary member straight away. The first 46 members included the Duke of Northumberland, two baronets, plus one gentleman about to become a baronet, a knight of the realm, and five ministers of the church. Most of the others were local landowners or captains of industry. The first president was Sir John Swinburne, the sixth baronet of Capeen, who presented the society with his seal. Um, the rather piratical appearance is due to the fact that he managed to blow half his head off in a hunting accident on his own estate. I'm afraid I, as the current president, is nowhere near, and nowhere near as exciting <coughs> as the first president. The society seal was designed by Mr. Howard of the Royal Academy. This is presumed the artist Henry Howard, who was secretary of the Royal Academy at the time. As he was based in London, it was more convenient for him to next, nip next door to the Society of Antiquaries of London to see what they had, which was relevant, that could be made into an interesting seal image. He chose a small altar from Benwell, uh, RIV 1331, which had been found in 1751 when the Newcastle Carlisle Road was being built. The dedication is to the Lamas Tebus, the three witches, if one believes that the inscription is actually genuine, in which there is some dispute about. The seal shows a female figure recording the proceedings of our society with scripture lines, writings in Dior, and Greek. Around the edge in Latin, it is stated. This is the seal of the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle Upon Tyne, 1813. The famous engraver Thomas Buick produced the woodblock from which all our printed matter has been produced ever since. So we have a slightly bizarre situation that the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle Upon Tyne has an altar belonging to the Society of Antiquaries of London on its seal. After some discussion with the Newcastle Corporation, it was agreed that the Society could hold its meeting in the keep, which it recently has a little bit of restoration. Um, the keep is the building um, it's, it's that building there, which is disappearing this really kind of um, the long um, uh, 
1819, it had moved back to the big market pub because of the poor state of the heat. It was actually freezing cold and water tends to pour down the staircase. So a nasty habit of still that. In 1820, in, sorry, in 1824, it was felt that this was not a suitable venue, that was the pub, and they were welcomed back by their parents' body with the written film. In 1848, the keeper was restored by the architect John Dobson, following a campaign by the society, and they moved it back in. But it still wasn't exactly cosy, although now it had very nice bathrooms. Um, and they transferred to the Black Gate, which is the uh, building on the other side with the um, Hans Christian Anderson type roof on it, which they they put on. Um, <coughs> but again, it wasn't really very good. Um, the problem was that the it, the big black gate really wasn't big enough for a very much virgin society. So in 1930, they moved to the Mining Institute Lecture Theatre, and that is where we still have our monthly meetings, although the black gate continued to be our headquarters where we had the library until 2008. <coughs> the society started to collect artifacts, coins, and books at its first meeting. The first object donated being a remarkable British quirk. We think we know which one it is, but they have a tendency to look very similar, so we couldn't be sure. After the collection grew too large to be housed in the room we built, it was moved to the Keep and the Black Gate, where it stayed until 1956, when Dr. David Smith, a bright young man of Sir Ian Richmond's acquaintance, began work on cataloguing and moving the archaeological collections to the Museum of Antiquities in the then Armstrong College of the University of Durham, now the University of Newcastle, where they stayed until the Great Northern Museum was opened in 2000. Nine. When John Bell wrote to his prospective fellow members in January 1813, he was particularly keen that they collected coins. He himself was a numismatist and had attempted to start a numismatic society a few years earlier, which had failed because it was too specialist. The society's numismatic collection is now extensive, with 1,594 Roman coins not including coins from excavation assemblages and 1,067 of the Greek coins, which were recently published in a syllogy in the British Museum, as well as a large collection of medieval coins, checkers, and tokens. Most of this material came from private collectors, a so-called boys' collection, but it is not to be disparaged because of that. Some choice items include this, oops, sorry, include this um, silver cross and crosslet penny of Henry II, which was minted in Newcastle. We also have the Hewitt Pot and two of its associated coins. Now, the Hewitt Pot is a very interesting tale. It was found in late 1812 in the churchyard at Hewitt. Now, John Hodgson, who was the, one of our founder members and the incumbent at Hewitt, had a bit of a feeling point about the idea that Hewitt was as old as Jarrow. And when his pot was found, so there was a tiny pot like that, um, full of so-called strikers, he got very excited. And this was considered to be a tremendous find. It was only in the 1980s that it was discovered by analysis that the strikers were all made of Georgian pennies. Um, all the technological possibilities that could be thrown at the pot have been thrown at the pot, um, which has basically come up with three possible and very diverse dates, so we have no idea what they is, but basically it's a hoax. And I think it's very interesting that it was a very badly timed hoax because this was a hoax in late 1812. The antiquaries were formed just a few months later um, and they accepted this as genuine at the time, having no contrary evidence. And I think whoever was the hoaxer would never find out who it was. Obviously he felt a bit nervous about exposing these very high class gentlemen and very learned gentlemen. And so it continued as a hoax for a very long time. As the late Elizabeth Perry said, one could say it was a hoax in the land of Piltdown, but not Piltdown, a hoax in the land of Hewitt. The rest of our cycle collection is genuine, and it, as we hope, the collection most of the Northumberland is extensive. Many of you will be familiar with Elizabeth Perry's publication of these in a free standard monograph published by the Society, as well as the exemplary paper in Archaeology in the Art 2004. As well as coins, we also have a fascinating collection of medals which record events in the region. Uh, this one is not actually local, but I particularly like it. It commemorates the numismatist Richard Saint Hill of Devon, 
and on the reverse, you can see here, there is the slogan irradiating the present, restoring the past, which is a splendid strap line. Um, but we get the name of Moon's Martyr. The Society also has an art collection. Now, I will admit this does not include any major works. There's no hidden whole volumes or anything like that. It's mostly topographic in nature, but it does include some very interesting images. This is a watercolour showing the old bridge at Morgan by James Bell Smith in 1844. And I draw your attention to the building at the far end of the bridge with the oval window, because you'll need to see that again in a little bit later on. So some of these are very beautiful um, topographical drawings, prints, etchings, um, which show buildings which are still there, buildings which are no longer there. This, however, is called the Night of Tap, and it's by Robert Spence. Now, this is a very interesting example of how you should wander into the area of art criticism and self trepidation. The painting was first called Tap on Housesteads, and it was painted by Robert Spence in 1910 for the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. It was considerably large in this, and it was a daytime attack. However, he foolishly showed the antiquaries of Newcastle the painting, and then he promptly pointed out all the mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> he then cut it down to about two-thirds of its original size, and darkened it so it was a night attack, so you couldn't see all the errors. <laughs> and thought he'd get away with it, but finally he just looks for will to live and he donated it to society. It is extremely large, it is extremely heavy, and it's been a bane in my life for some years. <laughs> um, so just you do be careful if you want to the area of art criticism, you can get out of hand. The early antiquaries were a bloodthirsty lot and were very keen on collecting arms and armour. Um, we have a number of cannon, here we have a 16th century swivel gun, which is, um, was in the Tower of London. Back in Britain. An English close helm of the late 16th to early 17th century. We also have a fine collection of pikes. Um, the problem with pikes is it's not terribly clear which ones are genuine Civil War pikes and which ones were pikes made um, in the 1920s for a large pageant. Um, but there were very large amount of them in the old Museum of Antiquities. And I always used to think that if the students thought it revolted, um, I'd be able to defend the department in the museum very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, the society's members would be equally well equipped. Um, we have got a remarkable collection of, of guns. There's one particular one, which I don't have a photograph of. It's a little handgun about so big. It has a nifty little bear attached to it. And this was regarded as the sort of thing that any gentleman on the ground told would need to cause a car to trust the foreigners. Um, <laughs> it was also very dangerous being antiquated in Northumberland in the early 19th century. Um, there were man traps, there were gene traps, there were gamekeepers armed to the teeth, but also the Armstrongs, large sections of Northumberland were still considered to be a no go area because of weavers. Um, it really did discourage exploration of the more local and more wooded areas. And we have on display an exhibition put on in the Great North Museum in Newcastle, the celebrated by Bison TV, the most enormous man trap I've ever seen. In fact, it looked more like an elephant trap, but it certainly would discourage the most avid antiquarian from its pursuits. The Society's members collected a wide range of material, including archives, but they had to sense, they had to, sense to realize that collecting archives that were to them contemporary was just as important as collecting ancient archives. Here we have a handbill advertising a cruise on the 11th of May, 1839, to visit the heroine Grace Darling. You will notice this was to be an overnight event. They were setting off from Newcastle Quayside and heading up the coast. Um, I'm not sure whether they were visiting her for supper or waiting on board and then visiting her for breakfast. It's not very clear exactly when the poor woman was going to be inundated by all these people. Um, but as long as they paid their five shillings, they were guaranteed to be taken there and back. Some of our archives would benefit from further research. I do strongly say that the Woodhorn archives in Northumberland are full of material that belongs to the antiquaries. A lot is published, but an awful lot is not published. And an example of this is a transfer of land to his nephew by Ronald Flambard, Bishop of Durham, which can be dated to just before 1128 when Ronald Flambard died. There's also a deed of sale 
of slaves for the sum of £850 dated to 1815 at the curiously named Blackman's plantation in Jamaica, which was witnessed in Newcastle. I'd love somebody to do a bit more work on that. Against head resident called Mr. Wilson gathered up any printed ephemera he could find regarding Gateshead in the 19th century, and the resulting volume was a treasure trove of information from a poster exhorting the people and publicans of Gateshead to behave in a seemly manner on the day of Queen Charlotte's funeral in 1818, to an advertisement in which a Mr. Dowry offers to educate the resident's children in maths, scientific, as well as the reading, French, and Latin, further offering to hold evening classes for those children too busy working during the day. Another sheet records the tale of a wonderful young woman who had worked as a sailor for several years, but who was being sued by her employers when they found out that she was the woman. They tried to claim her wages back, despite the fact she had done the work satisfactorily. It is clear, however, from the sheet that public opinion was on her side. Some members collected in specific areas of archives. This comes from a volume of cards, papers, and articles recording how Valentine's Day was celebrated through the years. The policeman is only one of a series of paper sheets to be sent on the day in 1917 to the borough of choice. There are also meetings for soldiers, bakers, butchers, etc., although none of the poems are exactly, exactly flattering. One area of our, of our archives we are expecting to be using, used a great deal for next year is our First World War poster collection. Some of these are recruiting posters. I will tell the population very firmly what they should be doing and thinking. And there's one particular poster which we have not put on display. It tells 20 reasons to hate the Germans. It's the most politically incorrect document I think I've ever read. <laughs> one of the joys of our archive collection is the Brooks collection of autographs. John Cross Brooks was a war then ship owner who inherited an autograph collection from his uncle. He then added it to it himself, arranging it by profession in 26 well known Marion volumes. So there's a book of bishops and a book of United States presidents. Um, this one you might be able to see is signed by Abraham Lincoln. And it is on a little visiting card and it is introducing a Mr. Silversmith to the Secretary of State of the United States at the time, um, 1864. Mr. Silversmith, in terms I've done a bit of research, was a gentleman who wrote a very important book, which was a handbook <coughs> for miners and assayers, which now is still in print and was a major part of the great gold rush in America and um, subsequent mining activities. The Brooks collection of autographs are very rare than just a signature. Occasionally you get a, um, an etching of Byron, for example, with a, a signature on it, um, the sort of thing that um, teenagers get from pop stars these days, we have a very the signature, and um, a few things like that. But most of the Brooks autographs tend to be at the end of letters, or in the case of Elizabeth I, a poem. So hidden in this collection is a wealth of detail and information. And this one you might particularly like, um, this is from Florence Nightingale, ordering from Mrs. Fulker um, three dozen soap tins. She obviously doesn't like the ones that she had before, up with her on the scratch, she said. Um, of all the archives, however, I think my favourite is a small book recording the events surrounding the ill-fated balloon ascent from the town hall in 1756. Mr. Vincent Lunardi was the intrepid aeronautist, an Italian who was going around Britain earning his living by making ascents. On this occasion, however, Mr. Ralph Perrin, the 21-year-old son of a local magistrate, got entangled in the guy ropes and was carried 200 feet in the air, falling to his death in the near allotment. According to a new uh, local newspaper report, Mr. Unardi had to skip Newcastle with speed following an outbreak of what was described as the balloon launch. Probably not a problem happened, which is interesting. Also at the first meeting, it was agreed that any self-respecting antiquarian society was quite lively, and books started to flood in. This shows the society's library in 1890. Um, notice the large amount of weaponry and armour on the wall. And this is our library today um, in the Great North Museum. It was moved with offices to the Great North Museum a few years ago, um, but the space has already caused a bursting. Part of, our, part of our problem in finding space for books is our very bad habit of publishing books. <laughs> our internationally recognised journal, Archaeologia Ariana, 
had a somewhat hesitant start, but the first volume came out in 1822. The first four volumes came out over a of 42 years, and the London antiquarian Charles Rich Smith took us to task in 1851, saying how very tired of your society is of publishing. Does the Society of Antiquaries ever intend putting forth another volume? You will be ruined if you do not publish the transactions. This, was, this rebuke was taken to heart, and Archimedes Aeliana has been annual since the 1850s. Throughout the 19th century, we also published our proceedings, but this series was discontinued in 1957 on cost. As well as our journal, we have also published series of court roles, monographs, exploration reports, catalogues, and guides, culminating in these fabulous of publication edited by David Rees and available from one of our members at 10 times, including President Maggie. Um, <laughs> I should point out that in our 200 years, and despite all the publications we've done, we have only ever had six principal editors. Um, if you become a, an editor of the Society of Antiquities from across all time, your insurance company look very pleased because they tend to not for a very long time. And this um, splendidly custom gentleman is Robert Blair. And he shows the toughness of the editorial reading. He was a Sam Shield solicitor who was our secretary and editor between 1883 and 1923. And also found time to edit five editions of the Colin Bruce Handbook to Hayward's Wolf. The 14th edition of the handbook, also edited by David Rees, was published by the Society in 2006. Now, Robert Blair was an accomplished draftsman and enjoyed sketching sites, buildings, and artifacts. These he collected in leather bound volumes annually, and we have 35 of them. And it was in one of these Blair sketchbooks that I found the evidence that the bronze dog statue known as the Scotty came from Chester's Fort and not the common team as well at Caribou. What we would like to do at some stage is actually to digitize a lot of Blair sketchbooks. Um, he started by working just in the area around the wall, but <laughs> after a while, he started to take his holidays further afield. And then he discovered foreign travel. But because he was largely sketching um, vernacular architecture, I got the feeling that almost 90% of the buildings in these sketchbooks are no longer in stand. And I, we are sitting on this amazing resource which very few people know about. Now, society has never been afraid of interfering in matters of true dead concern. And this is particularly so in regards to the traditional music of the north of England. The Society's founding member, John Bell, was fascinated by local music, and it was largely at his behest that the Society's Ancient Melodies Committee was formed with the intention of recording the musical heritage of the region. In 1882, we published the Northumberland Minstrelsy, in which was set in stone which ancient words went with which traditional tune. This was not without its critics at the time, so there were quite a few arguments about which traditional words went with which traditional tune. And the society also attempted to go for the cleaner version of the words. <laughs> uh, but it is now the Bible for folk music in the area and is the basis for far a folk archive resource to the Northeast. We also own an important collection of music manuscripts, including this 18th century volume of music for the Northumbrian pipes. And of course, we also have the pipes themselves. And no matter how carefully you are photographing these or showing them on display, they still tend to look like a great um, <laughs> This is a set of pipes by Robert Reed. And the reason why we have so many pipes, we did have a few, but this gentleman here, Mr. William Cox, at his cottage door in Whiteley. Um, Mr. Cox was a very curious man. On his death in 1971, he bequeathed his extensive pipe collection to the society along with his prehistoric food collections and a range of social history items. To say he was eccentric, I think I'm stressing that. Um, he also bequeathed the society a large number of phonographs and enormous numbers of wax cylinders to play on the phonographs. Um, none of these are terribly exciting, it's most beautiful uh, noises, um, songs, tunes, whatever. And when we were clearing out the black gates, Derek Cups, the vice president, and I were trying to see what was in these, and we got one of the photographs working. And we put on a wax cylinder expecting some marvelous Northumberland music to come out. And very immediately, we heard as we turned the handle of Teddy Bear's picnic. Now, <laughs> uh, Mr. Cox, at his house in Lightning, had an armchair on both sides of the fire. 
and he used to sit long into the evenings in one, and he had a human skeleton sitting in the other. And when he thought of the two of them sitting there solemnly listening to the teddy bear's picket, he has remained with me for some time and will probably never go. The Cox collection forms the long couple of pipes and associated material in the Morford Chantry Bagpipe Museum. Um, this is the building I pointed out to you before, this is it on the other side. This is a 13th century chantry in Morgan, which is now stuffed to the gulls with bike pipes. As well as collecting, the society's members wanted to be active in the field and have played their part in excavating in the region. Um, I have a photograph of Chief Green in Picking Chief. A complex arrangement of portraits and marching camps on the Otterburn Range. Professor Ian Richmond, our president between 1951 and 1953, examined the site in 1956 as part of his survey of Rhone's sites in Northumberland, the Society's publication of the Northumberland County History. I should point out there has never been a Victoria County History of Northumberland because the Society of Antiquaries and Newcastle beat the Royal Commission to it. And there are 15 volumes of Northumberland County History. The first excavations in the Rome Winter Zone of Cook and Turn Scientific were carried out by John Hodgson, one of our founder members, and Anthony Headley, who didn't join until 1822. Hodgson dug, dug at House Stones in 1822 to 3, while Headley worked at Binderlander in 1818 and from 1829 to 1835. Their reasons to excavate were, and I quote, to understand the stationary economy of the Romans. Later, excavations by Bowes and Kent at House States in 1898 were to uncover the first complete plan of the interior of the Roman port in a society of public excavation. 100 years later, Charles Daniels, our president from 1978 to 1980, was to conduct the first full excavation of the Roman port in Britain when he excavated at Hope's End. In the 19th century, war studies were dominated by John Clayton, vice president from 1856 to 1890 and John Collin of Bruce, our secretary from 1856 to 1890. People didn't give up their um, roles very easily in those days. The Society was the first to, to subscribe to the publication of the Bruce's Royal Award in 1851, and also published his Lapidario Sacramento in 1875. Society members do not just enjoy getting out and excavating, they also like a good outing. And we continue to have three or four country meetings each year. In the early years, these tended to be full of incidents. And on August the 3rd, we are going to be reenacting an amalgam of our visits to Linda's farm. Um, Linda's farm seems to have been a place of some danger for an antiquarian outing, so I thought she was a certain amount of nervousness. Um, when you read the accounts of these outings, you clear that. The members were not just intrepid, but were very keen to enjoy themselves. The trip to Linda's farm in 1857 started with breakfast, and we will indeed be having a Victorian breakfast at the assembly rooms on August the 3rd. They then used to go on a horse drawn break, which rather limited where they could go, but as soon as there were trains, they were on the train, and in fact, we will be in training on August the 3rd. On this particular item to Linda's farm, the day they had their breakfast, they got on the train, they got off the train at Beale, they got into horse drawn brakes, and they trotted across the causeway. They then were addressed by the higher clergy, and I have in fact pinned down a higher clergy to, to come and talk to us on that occasion. Um, but the women seem to have remarkably scant attention. What did have attention was an enormous champagne lunch. <laughs> And quite frankly, they seem to have got quite tilled. And on the way back, they had problems because the causeway, um, I'll show you this picture, this is the causeway in 1908, this is them on their way back. And you can see the causeway just means that they exist in the dry pit of sand. And on this occasion, they got bogged down. And there's this lovely bit in the report that says the ladies drew attention to their fights while turning their handkerchiefs at the end of their parasols and waving them in the air. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, at some stage on August the 3rd, I will be giving the instruction up parasols, <laughs> <laughs> but I do have to go to the pub at Beale, which has a camera fixed on the causeway so they can see if anyone's in trouble, to explain that we are not in distress, that we're simply reenacting another distressing moment. 
As the first Lady Chancellor involved the Champagne Lunch, so did most of the others. In 1883, the members were welcomed by Cadwallader of Bates at Langley Castle with refreshments on the law. Although they then agreed with the court, they seemed to have had to hear a very long paper form before they could get their hands on the ring. That was the same year that Sir Charles Trevelyan entertained the Society of Wellington for a most liberal lunch. But I'm not sure if that refers to the amount of food and drink on the purpose. Um, I, I don't know whether it's fraudulent or bad photograph, but this is their visit to Ottoman Towers in 1923, home of Howard Peace. On the whole, they tended to go and visit um, fellow members' houses, and there's usual comments about that we had sherry in the undercroft. And such like. Again, I don't think my house and members would quite come to uh, the undercroft. I feel I'm not really coming up to spec here. Uh, <laughs> and that's a, um, Today we visit sites that are familiar to the early members, but we also visit some that would have been completely beyond their comprehension. In 2011, for example, we went to visit Spain and Waste, which is now there, um, settlement of, um, in Cumbria, and the site of the Blue Street. Waffles. It was also extremely colourful that no one didn't have a champagne lunch there. It was Bruce's visit to the wall in 1848 that was to lead to the decennial pilgrimage of Hadrian's Wall. Watered in his planned trip to the continent to find a dangerous piece of the situation, he decided to visit the wall. And there he is. Um, this is a chap wearing a top hat, perched nimbly on a rock, and the little boy with the strange hat sitting on top of the big rock, is his son Gainsford. John Roger Bruce went with his son Gainsford and two local artists, the Richardson brothers, and they headed along Hadrian's Wall, visiting all the sites they could get to. When they came back, John Colin Bruce gave a talk to the Literary and Philosophical Society in the last one time, using the watercolours by the Richardsons as educational aids. Unfortunately, because it was very rare for people to go out into that central sector because it was still seen to be a really dangerous area where you were going to be attacked by bandits. Um, the members of the Human Philosophical Society just did not believe that these sites were still there in the condition they were in. And so he said that he would take a pilgrimage of like minded gentlemen and ladies on this occasion and in the summer. And that was the first pilgrimage of Hadrian's War. And of course, nowadays we go every 10 years with our sister society, we call the Western Society. And here you see the latest group of pilgrimage in 2009 being addressed by Matt Simmons. There is a serious side to the antiquaries, though, and over the years, local councils and landowners have learned not to mess with us. In 1848, concern about the condition of the keep of the new castle and its threat by the railways led to a fundraising drive by the society. You can see, um, if you look behind on the far side, you can see the railway going past. You can't get a postcard between the keep and the railway. In there, of course, they didn't have a society of antiquaries, and their cops were the stop over and all those out of the way. We kept ours, and we put the documents on all the rest. Um, the way they managed to do this was by having a fundraising dinner. Here we have the fundraising dinner. There were three tables. And each one was chaired by Duke of Northumberland or somebody with the nobility. And the idea was that they were going to have a centerpiece in each table. And if you look very carefully at the table at the bottom there, you can see a boar's head. You might notice there's a gap in the other table. The idea was there's going to be a boar's head on one table, a peacock on another, and a swan on the other. The swan and the peacock were both ordered in the form of the masons, but did not arrive. <laughs> and I was very tempted on my way here tonight to go over and say, can we please find and have our stuffed swan and our stuffed peacock. But this was successful, and the keep was saved for Newcastle. In 1850, there was a plan by the government to use Time Land Priory, particularly the Lady Chapel, as an army to store gunpowder and to knock down some other parts of the buildings. This was dealt with very firmly by Society of Grace, who wrote a terse note to the treasurer and told them they could not do this, and they didn't. And it is still there for English heritage to look after now. Then there was the Black Gate. The Black 
Gates in the early 19th century was basically a slum. There were at least 60 families, at one point there were up to 80 families living in and around the Black Gate. Um, you could hardly see it. This slide shows, you can see the white, whitewash, that is from some buildings which have been knocked down, but on the left hand side you can still see there are still some buildings there. It was the very spoiled, and in fact one of the aldermen at the time referred to it as a borrower's example of antiquity, and he wasn't very keen on keeping it, and in fact the idea was to pull it down and build an average park, which would have been very pleasant in the middle of the city. But the Society of Antiquaries galvanized itself and led what I think is the first national heritage campaign, and it was saved. At the moment, the Society is working in a project with the City Council and the Cathedral of St. Nicholas in the Heart of the City project, which, uh, with the Heritage Lottery funding, is revitalizing the Black Gate and the Cube and making them more accessible to the public. Um, and that's a major piece of work that we're doing at the moment. So it's not what we did in the past. We are still very much attached to these buildings and making sure that they get the best care. It's not just buildings that we've saved. We've saved the central sector of Hadrian's Wall. Uh, this is called Fields Quarry. Um, we can see that in the 19th century, the area of Hadrian's Wall did suffer quite a lot of quarry. And in 1930, there was a major plan to quarry all around Hadrian's Wall. Now, the Roman Stone Company, subtly called, um, said that it wasn't a problem because the wall itself would be left. They would quarry on either side. That just would have left Hadrian's Wall on this very tight, narrow corridor, which you would have needed crampons to get up to see what's going on. And the antiquaries really didn't like this idea at all. And they started what turned into an international um, campaign. Um, the New Zealand Times um, wrote a particularly stirring article supporting the Society of Antiquaries in the past of all time. It was a very interesting scenario. Um, George Lansbury, who was the minister at the time, came up to visit the war. He did have a slight problem in that most of the members of the civil service who came with him were also members of the Society of Antiquaries who had lost the whole time. So he may have got slightly got at. Um, and he decided that this was not appropriate, and it led to the 1931 Ancient Monuments Act which involves the environment of an ancient monument, not just the ancient monument itself. Sadly for George Lansby, who spent his whole life as a socialist fighting for the right of the working man to have jobs, this was the only piece of legislation we got from Parliament, and it was the piece of legislation that put several people out of work in the nearby town of Oxford. We also save artifacts. Um, this is the famous Amelia Fingering, which may or may not, depending on your opinion, um, be the earliest Christian artifact from Rome and Britain. And in um, 1990, um, 1990, we saved this from being sold to an American museum. I do not get Christmas cards from that American museum anymore, but you can't annoy us. Um, <laughs> we do not normally acquire our collections by purchase, although we are the only body in the North of England who can respond when material is found in the Treasure Act. We are the main collector for archaeology for the North of England, and as such, material flows into us at the Great North Museum. And we do have a bit of a problem about collecting stone. This is the Roman stone room, as it was called in the 19th century. You can see we have a very fine collection of Roman sculpture at that time, um, and we have gone on collecting. Um, this particular one, the Centurial Stone from Newburgh, is one which doesn't get as much attention as it should do. Um, a rather strange looking in the book. It's more like a constipated vulture, but um, there we have a very nice piece of a Roman inscription. And it's not just Roman. I think people tend to think of us as a um, society that collects Roman and we are the main society for Hadrian's Wall. But we have an amazing collection of first material. This is a very handsome old age pot from Jesmond. And we also have in our collection the Old Park Swords and the Wallington Port. The Bronze Age in England being divided into various sections, one of which is called the Wilton Park period and one the Wilton Wilton period, named after the material from our collection. And of course, Anglo Saxon material, and these are two of the Parker Green name stones, but we also have material from the Waterbury Cross, the earliest Christian route in England, and all sorts of other types of material which can be dated to the Anglo Saxon period. Social history 
history isn't what we know. We have an enormous collection of social history. And we do have problems working out with our social history collection sometimes what was actually donated as something which is interesting and what might have just been bought because it was needed. And in the collection, we have a very large mouse trap. It's not so much a mouse trap, more mouse squisher. But the idea is the mouse goes in this huge block of wood goes down the top of it. And I have no idea whether this was donated to the society because it was interesting or not, or whether there was an infestation of rodents in the back gate or the keep that it was needed. And I probably would never know. But Beamish Museum is an enormous collection of lots of sight antiquaries and indeed um, Discovery Museum and the Boat Museum has material from society. One particular piece of social history, however, which is in South Shields Museum, is this, Jobrin's gibbet. Um, this is one of the late, it, it's one of the last gibbets to be used in England. Um, it was in 1786 when a miner called William uh, Jobrin, whose facsimile is in um, that gibbet dangling away there, um, killed Nicholas Fairless, who was a local magistrate and mine owner. And he was dragged through the streets of Shields on a cart and then gibbeted on Jarrah Slake. Why we then got to the gibbet, I'm not totally clear, but the antiquaries were always interested in it, it was interesting, and we were well everything. Archaeological material is in the Great North Museum. Um, it's a far more modern view of our museum than the old museum antiquities or indeed the Black Gate. And although it was opened only in 2009, it has already welcomed its two million visitor. So our material is being seen by a lot of people. We also sponsor archaeological research, although not as generously as we did in days of yore due to the expense. Um, Timescape, for example, carrying out a receptivity survey at risk of sponsored by the society. We are also currently sponsoring an investigation of the village of Great Whittingham, just a mile or so north of Hadrian's Wall which has been producing a wider range of material from the Bronze Age, from the Bronze Age to the late medieval period. Very interesting site indeed. We are still very lively lot. This is a walk that we held on January the 5th of this year at Great Central Newcastle. We still collect artifacts and archives. We still hold monthly meetings. We still publish archaeology and yarn and other publications. We still have a library, so we go on jolly outings, so hopefully you don't get stuck in your big sounds of the religious farm. In other words, the Society of Antiquaries in New Cross upon Time is 200 and not out. Mm -hmm. If you wish to know more about society, then this volume is available, as I said before, to £10 to give the person packet from this um, email from one of our members in the Vicar. It gives me great pleasure to close my talk to you tonight by presenting your presence with a copy. Thank you very much.